teleconferences. And at this time, I will, would like to introduce Project ER-1610. This was a CERTIP project entitled Computational and Experimental Investigation of Contaminant Plume Response to Dean Apple's Source Zone Architecture and Depletion in Porous and Fractured Media. We have Ed Siddiqui and Walter Illman with us today from the University of Waterloo, and I will turn the presentation over to them. Well, hi, this is Ed here. Uh, we also have Sean Frape from the University of Waterloo. Um, the project, as you know, covered a quite a broad range of topics from uh, modeling to uh, field and lab studies to development of isotope uh, techniques. So uh, we sort of decided that uh, each of us will give uh, short or give talks on some components that involved our direct research, if that's okay. Okay, so uh, we're, uh, I'll just flip to slide two. Um, so the project team was myself, uh, Walter Illman, Sean Freight from uh, the University of Waterloo, and Jim Ye from the University of Arizona as a subcontractor who provided some expertise on uh, stochast stochastic inverse modeling. Uh, slide three, just as a background, um, I think we all know that uh, there's been a great deal of uh, work in trying to better understand processes affecting the fate of uh, d uh, in the subsurface, uh, certainly in unconsolidated ge geologic deposits, but a little less work, I would say, on certainly the modeling of uh, d apple migration uh, in uh, uh, complex uh, fractured geologic materials. So we addressed this topic in, in our project. Um, well, I think it's generally true, certainly with fractured rock because of the complexities involved, uh, that probably it's safe to say that not many sites have been, let's say, completely restored, perhaps remediated is not the right word, and hence there is a better need to understand how plumes respond to these complex Dean Apple sources that can uh, uh, emerge in, in uh, very heterogeneous porous or fractured geologic media. So the project was initiated in 2008 and then we had a one-year uh, extension to do some of the write-up and allow students to finish up. So the original statement of need that was put out by CERTIP uh, basically uh, was to better understand Dean Apple source zones and plume response responses to uh, uh, Dean Apple source depletions. So let me just uh, slide four now, go over some of the technical objectives, or the, at least the main objectives. Uh, the first was to develop computational tools for uh, predicting or uh, forecasting aqueous phase plume response to Dean Apple source zone architectures in both porous and fractured geologic media. Uh, there's been, as we all know, quite a lot of work. Yes. In, uh, Great. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. Bye. Hello? I'm uh, sorry, much, go much, ahead. Yes, sorry, go ahead. Okay, uh, but there's certainly been uh, very little, I would say, uh, three-dimensional modeling of how plumes emerge or evolve from uh, source zones in fractured geologic media. So part of it was developing computational tools, and then we did a suite of numerical experiments to understand, understand the relationship between the Apple source zone characteristics and the dissolved phase plume migration. One of the original objectives was to explore using stochastic information fusion, in other words, inverse modeling, to see if we could uncover source zone characteristics uh, from measurements of heads or concentrations in an aqueous phase in a plume. Uh, labor a suite of laboratory experiments, uh, column experiments, for example, or batch experiments were uh, performed to, to explore or test our computational methods, but more so to understand there's a large component involving isotopes and their fractionations due to things like degradation and dissolution and sorption. So there's quite a number of experiments done to explore that. <coughs> um, and then uh, finally, we have this site in Ontario, some of you may have heard of, uh, the Smithville site located near Niagara Falls, Canada, which back in the uh, um, early, early 80s or thereabouts uh, was discovered uh, rather serious Dean Apple problems. Uh, uh, it was originally designed to be a PCB storage 
uh, facility, and the unscrupulous operator um, had dug pits and so on and was taking all kinds of liquid waste and depositing it into these pits, and it became a, a, a front-page news at the time. <clears throat> and it was taken over by the Ontario Ministry of Environment, this whole site, to manage it and so on. And in fact, they're still doing it to this day some almost 30 years later, so it was a good, well-characterized site for us to explore in the field. So let me just uh, briefly go through some of the things we did. Uh, on the modeling side, um, we have a model called Conflo. It's a multi-phase compositional model. Um, all three phases can be active, the aqueous phase, the non-aqueous phase, and the gas phase. And uh, it required some enhancements to better incorporate uh, discrete fracture networks in three dimensions uh, to understand this, how Dean apples penetrate through the fracture network and how the dissolution occurs near form uh, uh, aqueous flame plume down gradient. And another key uh, element that was added to the model, which is I think the first time ever in a multi-phase uh, compositional model, was to include uh, degradation along with uh, isotope uh, fractionation. So that was a fairly major development step. And it's just a little diagram there of clever ways to uh, incorporate fractures into a multi-phase model. That is a very challenging task because as we know, fractures are not very large. They have a small volume and uh, very small changes in, for example, uh, pressure can, and capillary pressure can induce a very large change in fracture, so it's an extremely nonlinear problem. And there was a lot of development work to uh, gain some robustness in the model to, to achieve that. <coughs> um, this is just a, a schematic on slide, where are we, slide five? There's no number on that one. Six? There's no number. Sorry, it's, uh, you'll see uh, isotopologs of uh, uh, for example, here, chlorine uh, uh, isotopes. And you can see that uh, when you consider all the various uh, components, there are 15 of them, and many different uh, decay branching uh, pathways that have to be taken into account. And going from the PCE to TC to CIS to VC to ethylene uh, along the degradation pathways. So. So all of these kinds of things were coded into the model, these, these pathways with the uh, calculating the fractionations um, that would occur uh, during, for example, degradation. And we assume that uh, partitioning of the components between phases occurs as an equilibrium uh, type process. Um, for the very, very fine scale numerical simulations we're doing, very, very small grid blocks, et cetera, I believe that it's probably uh, equilibrium is a reasonable assumption to use. <clears throat> when you go to very large grid blocks and so on, that's when you start to uh, worry about treating it as, for example, dissolution as a kinetic type process. Um, this just shows you as an example the, in the multi-phase model. This is the one of the components. <clears throat> the uh, looks like an advection dispersion equation. Uh, so it's compositional. So you have uh, uh, one of these equations for, uh, for example, water is a component, air is a component, and various contaminants or dissolved substances are components. So I showed you in the previous slide there were 15 uh, isotope components, for example, uh, during the degradation of PC. So we have many, many, many of these equations. Um, I don't think I need to go through all the various terms unless someone wants to, but you see on the left hand sign it's accumulation term, cha basically change in, in <coughs> denapple mass or saturation. First term on the right hand side is the advection term. X is we write compositional equations in terms of mole fractions. V is the velocity. Next term is a dispersion term. And then the final two terms on the right hand side represents uh, the decay pathway, so you could have straight or branching decay chains. So the ingrowth of a daughter product uh, from the decay of the parent is represented in all of these summations. Um, another thing which uh, we sort of realized doing the inverse modeling with a full-blown uh, 
multi-phase compositional model is, is probably, well, not probably, we tested this, is not uh, uh, really uh, amenable because of enormous computational effort. I developed an analytical solution called CMM. It's a multi-species uh, advection, dispersion, uh, degradation uh, transport model. It's semi-analytical. It was published, I think, last year in the Journal of Contaminant Hydrology. Um, it's quite unique. It can do isotope transport, as I show. Um, but for degradation pathways, you can have all these as examples, A through E, um, straight decay chains, various types of splitting and diverging, converging decay chains. So we'll talk about splitting factors, for example, in a, a parent going to its various daughters, what proportions. And each, uh, <clears throat> each species can have its own uh, unique uh, degradation parameters, as well as things like uh, unique uh, retardation factors. I think this is probably the only analytic sol solution in the literature of this type. And it's 1D, 2D, or three-dimensional. Um, <clears throat> so with Conflow, what we did was we did a large number of uh, synthetic realizations of heterogeneous porous and fractured media, um, looked at what the source zones, how they evolve, and then of course the, the plumes that emerge uh, from, from the Dean Apple source zone. Um, <clears throat> and we include such things as uh, diffusion in a fractured media or in a heterogeneous porous media diffusion from the high, high permeability zones to the low permeability zones and back diffusion. So all these processes are included uh, in these simulations. Uh, we also looked at cases where um, the, uh, depending on, uh, if you're dealing with a fractured rock as an example, depending on the porosity and the capillary pressure curves for the matrix, if the entry pressure is sufficiently low, you can actually have some of the Dean Apple as a non-aqueous phase liquid which enters into the uh, uh, rock matrix. And of course, and we're not talking about aqueous phase diffusion here, but actually non-aqueous phase liquid. That becomes very problematic, as you can imagine, if you're going to try remediate by flush, some flushing technique. Um, and of course, there were a number of simulations to look at uh, uh, how important it is to know the heterogeneity, the fracture patterns, um, and understanding how uh, the stable isotopes respond um, uh, due to degradation or source zone dissolution. Um, analytical techniques, um, of course, the University of Waterloo Isotope Lab is quite renowned uh, in. in, in uh, analyzing isotopes for a variety of, of purposes. Um, it, 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 quite a long history of, of working with uh, carbon and, and chlorine, iso stable chlorine isotopes. I think my colleague here, Dr. Frank uh, Sean, was sort of one of the inventors of the chlorine to demonstrate how it can be used, for example, for fingerprinting uh, sources of uh, uh, or different manufacturers that might have produced the uh, compounds such as TCE or PCE. So you can use the stable chlorine isotopes to do those uh, types of analyses. Um, what one of the main points here was to develop a new technique to analyze uh, hydrogen uh, as it would exist in, in chlorinated uh, uh, solvents. And this new technique is a highly accurate uh, online technique. I think Sean might say a couple of words about that a little later on. Uh, how do I tell what slide we're on, Walter? There's no slide numbers. It's hidden. We have this little bar at the bottom of our screen which hides us. We're on task five, technical approach. Are, are you folks being able to keep up? Um, yeah, it's fine. Okay, we're on task five, technical approach. Um, I think Walter is going to jump in here and say a few things about the, the lab experiments. Um, so, hi, my name is Walter Illman, and um, we have, uh, in conjunction with the uh, modeling study, uh, doing uh, various uh, laboratory experiments, 
at different scales, and one of them was the batch experiments. The, the other one is the column experimental studies and also the sandbox experiments, but the batch experiments were done with different materials such as uh, clean sand, uh, sand from the Borden site, uh, crushed shale, activated carbon, carbonate, and so on at different concentrations of uh, TCE. And uh, we've tried uh, different sorption times to try to understand uh, whether it's uh, occurring at equilibrium or kinetic conditions. We tried to look at changes in uh, different uh, concentrations of TCE and also um, try to examine the effects of isotope fractionation. And uh, we have also conducted several column studies to try to understand whether isotope fractionation is affected by sorption and also biodegradation and have uh, uh, conducted several of those experiments um, and uh, measured uh, both concentration, uh, isotope uh, fractionation effects, <laughs> pH, and other parameters. Uh, we have also been conducting uh, laboratory sandbox and fractured rock block studies, uh, and those were done in order to try to uh, validate the computational tools that have been developed by the earlier tasks. And uh, to the left, we have a, a heterogeneous sandbox that was constructed, and uh, we can't really see it, but there are a large number of pressure transducers and sampling points and uh, it was designed so that we can characterize the heterogeneous aquifer and um, put in some TCE and trying to monitor the dissolution behavior and also uh, examine the effects of transport, diffusion, sorption, and so on. Uh, to the right is a, a, a sample of dolomite that was obtained uh, near the Smithville site. Um, and uh, we've prepared this so that uh, we can try to also conduct some, um, first of all, hydraulic experiments to try to uh, characterize a rock block, and I will elaborate on this a little bit more, but uh, more importantly, we uh, put in some TCE and try to monitor the dissolution behavior, and that's uh, uh, kind of important because we wanted to investigate um, whether we can use uh, uh, different techniques or modeling approaches to try to predict the uh, uh, transport behavior. And then <clears throat> the other component, task seven, is the field studies, and so we uh, try to take the techniques that we have developed uh, through the earlier tasks to try to uh, to try to uh, investigate um, the sort of the. Um, transport of the plume at the Smithville site. I don't want to elaborate on what uh, Ed has already talked about in terms of the site characteristics and so on, but I do want to mention that um, uh, a lot of site characterization actually has been done at this site, and according to Ed, um, and maybe in the report, um, a large number of single hole packer tests were conducted, and I believe it was over 2,000 um, measurements were conducted at uh, fairly narrow scales. And so if we wanted to, we could try to really try to understand the heterogeneity of the site um, in terms of the hydraulic conductivity. There's also other parameters available at the site, and so I think this is one of the most heavily characterized contaminated fractured rock sites, which could uh, perhaps in the future also be used as a, a place to study um, Dean Apple transport and uh, aqueous view, uh, phase bloom development. Um, and so what we have done here was to try to continue and expand the sample collection that has been done uh, continuously by the Ontario Ministry of Environment. And we have used some of the funding from our CERTA project and also an additional uh, small MOE project or Ministry of Environment project to try to obtain additional samples, uh, do some uh, isotope analysis and so on, and we'll be describing that uh, a little later. And then task eight consists of the modeling of both the laboratory and field data, and so uh, you'll see some of that, okay? So going back to results, I think Ed wanted to say a few things about that, so I'll 
Yeah, let me, microphone there. let me just show you uh, just some examples uh, involving our Complo simulations, uh, the three-phase simulations. This, this here, uh, task one results, uh, I'm just showing on uh, the uh, left uh, box, if you will, this was a synthetically generated uh, fracture network, um, <clears throat> which more or less mimics the uh, uh, fracturing we see at the Smithfield site. Uh, again, uh, at Smithfield there was a lot of uh, core logging, uh, downhole televiewer, caliper measurements, etc., to try and look at, uh, get some idea of the fracture patterns for each of the distinct uh, geologic units. So that was constructed uh, on the basis of that data set. And the fracture apertures are colored by, or uh, apertures are colored uh, so you can see the larger fracture, shallower, and so on. A lot of bedding plane, horizontal fractures. And uh, of course, you can see there's a, a, a TCE uh, release area uh, at the top of the box. So we release TCE roughly the same amount of. Uh, liquid that was estimated from field studies at the site. I think it was something on the order of 30,000 liters. And you can see on the right-hand side the uh, uh, Dean Apple saturation. So uh, red means high, higher saturations, and yellow is lower saturation. So you can see the extremely erratic uh, patterns that the Dean Apple source zone takes on. Uh, it can flow quite extensively horizontally in the bedding plane fractures and penetrate to considerable depths uh, uh, vertically within the site. So those are Dean Apple saturations. Um, but then uh, we're also, it's, as I mentioned, compositional model. So we can calculate the uh, <coughs> concentrations or mole fractions, if you will, uh, in the aqueous phase. So the diagram on the left is showing the uh, TCE mole fractions after a one-year period uh, in the fracture network. Again, there is more or less horizontal groundwater flow. So this, near the top, uh, you get higher concentrations carried laterally uh, towards the exit boundary. And then we can do things like calculating the mass fluxes crossing of compliance planes. Uh, we can also calculate the source zone depletion with time because of uh, dissolution. And then on the, uh, the right-hand panel figure, uh, the B figure, that shows uh, along some slices perpendicular and along the main flow direction of the uh, uh, mole fraction of TCE in the aqueous phase. So clearly you can see that there's uh, considerable matrix diffusion occurring. Uh, so the solutes are carried effectively most quickly along the fractures and then if, as we all know you get diffusion uh, into the rock matrix <coughs> and, and uh, some of these fractures are quite close together so the matrix blocks are almost becoming, well, quite high concentrations uh, within the matrix blocks. And if once a source, which would take many, many, many years, then you would get back diffusion from the fr uh, matrix back into the fractures. Um, <clears throat> let me just show you an example of the isotope uh, transport capabilities. This was in a porous media simulation. Um, so we have a box on figure A, um, which was populated with a heterogeneous hydraulic conductivity field, actually patterned after the Borden site. I think many of you may have heard of the Borden site. So flow is... Uh, in the aqueous phase is induced to be unidirectional. Uh, there's a flow arrow shown there. And then we released PCE here, and we studied uh, both the transport of the uh, total components uh, in, uh, in the aqueous phase, the PCE degradation pathway, as, a, as well as the isotopic fractionations. Um, the next figure shows uh, uh, well, for two scenarios, uh, section A, A prime is a horizontal or a vertical transverse uh, uh, cross section perpendicular to the groundwater flow direction, showing the NAPL saturations. B 
B is uh, along the flow direction, and the upper diagram, scenario one, is for a relatively small spill of Dean Apple, and scenario two is for a larger spill of Dean Apple. And you can see that some of the Dean Apple for scenario two has penetrated to the base of the flow system, has actually flowed laterally uh, for 10 or so meters from the source zone. <coughs> And uh, the, the next slide uh, is showing for scenario one, the panel on the left, panels on the left, and scenario two, the panels on the right. The upper diagrams are the mole fractions of uh, uh, the various components in the PCE degradation pathways. Um, you can clearly see that uh, scenario two on the left is for a, a much larger spill. It's a broader source zone. Um, and uh, in, in the case of uh, the uh, small spill on the left, uh, the concentrations are very strongly affected by dispersion. In the bottom two diagrams, we're showing the, uh, uh, I guess it's the carbon isotopes, uh, C13, and uh, enrichment due to various processes along the pathway. They're very distinct um, for each of the components. Um, the numbers are becoming much less negative as we move down the flow path. And this fractionation, actually, what we learned here was it gets rather complicated. You have fractionation due to degradation processes, but you also have fractionation induced because of the aqueous, non-aqueous phase transfer, and it kind of clouds the issue uh, with a, uh, just a, using a single isotope to try and understand uh, how much is degradation affecting fractionation and how much is uh, uh, dissolution affecting fractionation with just a single isotope. Um, it kind of suggests that if, you don't, if you're only using a single isotope, maybe you have to use a complex multi-phase flow model, which is not uh, standard practice in, in the modeling world for real sites. Um, the, the next slide, uh, task two, this just shows an example from that analytical multi-species transport model I had mentioned, um, where um, we applied it to an actual column experiment, and, and we wanted to see degradation. So this was a column experiment done prior by my colleague uh, Bob Gillum and one of his students using the granular iron enhancement, which we know speeds up the uh, degradation process. So the pathway we considered is in the arrow diagram on the left. And actually, there were quite a number of column experiments with concentration profiles measured at different times. And what we did was uh, coupled uh, the, the analytical solution to an inverse modeling approach. We actually could come up with the uh, degradation splitting factors uh, as well as the uh, half-lives for the uh, degradation process. So a paper is uh, in, in prep on, on this topic. It should be submitted to Journal of Contaminant Hydrology rather soon. And then uh, we also did a large number of uh, simulations in heterogeneous porous media based on a German aquifer analog. In the upper left diagram, you see a hydraulic conductivity uh, patterns uh, in three dimensions. That's based on actually 269,000 measurement points. The Germans are very energetic. Uh, and what we did was we said, well, wow, nobody's going to go to the field and make that many measurements, but Let's sample the reality, which is the upper left diagram. Let's sample it at fewer and fewer points to reconstruct the, the heterogeneous porous media. And again, conduct, conduct Dean Apple spill experiments in the reality as well as each of the uh, constructed uh, or reconstructed uh, aquifers from a limited number of points. And if you go through, we can calculate uh, things like uh, the fluxes at a compliance boundary shown in the right diagram, the mass remaining in the source, and so on. Uh, and you can see there's actually quite a lot of scatter. You can calculate a mean, but nevertheless, there's quite a lot of scatter uh, in the data. And uh, just to finish off some of the fracture system modeling, we also uh, patterned some simulations based on the actual Smithfield site which is shown in this diagram of the geology and the fracturing. Uh, if we flip to the next diagram, 
we did sensitivity analysis by doing things like altering the matrix permeability, the matrix porosity, and we're showing three cases here. And you can see the rather dramatic effect on, for example, aqueous phase plume concentrations, the bottom three diagrams, their sensitivity to things like matrix porosity. Matrix porosity goes down, matrix diffusion goes down, the plume becomes much longer and extensive. Uh, next slide just shows, uh, for example, the source zone depletion with time. Uh, we'll just look at that curve right now. That would be the, the dashed uh, black line. Uh, there we go. Walter's handy with the arrows. Um, so you can see, I, I just want to point one thing here out. To get down to uh, some, anywhere near 100%, you never really reach there, uh, that time scale is log. That's, that's a, approximately 1,000 years. Um, and it's pretty consistent even across all the different, uh, different uh, uh, material types. And then we, uh, did, again, did simulations by altering fracture apertures. Again, you can see the effect on the aqueous phase plume transport transports a little further with 200 micron than 50 micron, but matrix diffusion is playing a very large role in retarding or holding back the aqueous phase plume. And again, we can calculate things like uh, mass fluxes uh, crossing compliance plane, uh, the depletion of the source in percent, and we're seeing, once again, hundreds of years or perhaps even uh, close to 1,000 years for the source to be depleted. So I, I'm almost running out of time. I'll just uh, maybe uh, the results, I mean, I'll very quickly go through them. So of course the mass flux downstream and source zone depletion are strongly related. Um, with the decrease in matrix permeability, the d is confined to the fracture network, or an increase in the, in the uh, entry pressure for the rock matrix. Um, and we found that for Smithville type rocks, which have a modest or moderate uh, porosity, and we actually, in a prior study, had measured the uh, capillary pressure curves of the rock matrix, found the entry pressure is quite low. So it's suspected in Smithville, quite a lot of the Dean Apple actually did enter into the rocks matrix, which is problematic, and that means sources will be persistent for a very long period of time. <clears throat> Sean Frape here. Uh, task four was the refinement of an analytical technique, which uh, at the time, hydrogen, which uh, I'm sure everybody is familiar with the fact that uh, if we take TCE, it's 130, 131 mass units of which one or two are hydrogen or deuterium. So when you start getting down to parts per billion, we started to discover that you can't actually analyze the hydrogen. So we uh, asked her, Sertip whether we could have the funding to uh, develop this technique, and uh, Shokar, Stash, and Jeremy have been very successful. It took a time to do it, but they're successful in, in making this work. And hydrogen's very useful from the point of view that uh, most TCEs are very, very enriched. In fact, the most enriched compounds on the planet. Degradated TCEs from PCE are basically very depleted. So there's some cases over a thousand per mil difference between the two. So we were hoping that we can use this to, to see the differences between. Part of our problem here was to one, get a technique that was faster than the old offline technique, to get a technique that worked consistently at lower precision and could see these very small samples. So what we have here in the Shuikar, Stash, and Jeremy paper is this uh, chromium reduction method. It's a continuous flow method. We can see actually they've recently gone down as low as 50 parts per billion. And the only problem is as, as we decrease, and I'll just move this one slide ahead, basically as we decrease in amount, as we go down in amount, basically the precision um, uh, decreases as well. But the precision is, is much better, the standard deviations are much better in the new method than the, uh, the old method. That one diagram just shows you uh, from their paper shows you the uh, online versus the offline to show you that they are accurate, uh, that we get the same on our standards, the same too. 
A uh, couple of other things that basically are, are, are good about the method. It's faster, so you can do a lot of samples. Uh, you can do compound specific if there's enough of the degraded compound to find. But in general, it's opened up the world um, to the hydrogen world. And as far as I know, this is um, the only real hydrogen paper at the moment like this. There are several in preparation uh, as part of uh, Dr. Shuakar Stash's uh, CERTIP that is uh, separate from this particular CERTIP. So, next. Okay, so this is Walter Illman again. Um, so my PhD student is now finishing up some batch and column experimental studies. Um, and so we see that in this case, uh, we're just showing a subset of results from uh, TCE sorption on shale. So we're looking at the amount of TCE that is uh, remaining after some time. And uh, we see that uh, there is fractionation of chlorine um, for shale and also activated carbon. Um, we're also uh, looking at some column studies um, where we have uh, injection of aqueous phase TCE into the column and we're passing this uh, through the, the column and uh, stopping after several pore volumes. And what we're doing is sampling the, the concentrations uh, along some of the pores. And so we can see that the uh, increase in concentration initially, uh, maintaining constant, and then uh, stopping. So we see this drop off uh, and this tailing effect. Uh, and we've also sampled for uh, compound specific uh, chlorine. And so we see the, the fractionation effect. Uh, so we have this enrichment where we have the lighter isos lighter chlorine isotopes uh, sorbing, and uh, we see the uh, stopping of or ending of the TC injection over here, and then we see this uh, um, um, effect of the uh, enrichment going down, and it's kind of hard to see, but it actually increases a little bit, and the uh, uh, isotope geochemists have some um, explanation for this uh, that should be coming in a forthcoming paper. But anyway, the key finding is that the batch and column experiments show the sorption uh, causes a small but measurable isotope fractionation of the chlorine-stable isotopes. While for carbon, um, I think uh, Slater et al. back in 2000 established that uh, carbon doesn't, uh, carbon is not affected uh, by sorption. Um, we've also been working on the sandbox and fracture rock block studies. Uh, uh, here I'm going to talk uh, briefly about the fractured rock block studies, and we have done some inverse modeling of uh, pumping tests that were conducted in the fractured rock block to try to characterize this uh, dolo stone block. So here on the left side, we have a constant head reservoir, another constant head reservoir on here, and these circles over here represent uh, pressure transducer locations. Um, the ones that are open, and you can probably see the fractures over here. Uh, so the open circles represent the transducers that are located on fractures. The closed ones are in the matrix. And uh, this is just an example in terms of uh, the number of uh, the transducers. You can have less or more depending on the, uh, the budget. But anyway, the point is that uh, we want to try to map the hydraulic conductivity and the specific storage. And so here is a result of the hydraulic conductivity distribution after the inclusion of one pumping test that was conducted over here. This is a result from the inclusion of this pumping test and another one pumping taking place over here. And so we already start to see the, the locations of the high K uh, um, zones that delineate the fracture. And and this third case over here shows the hydraulic conductivity distribution after including three pumping tests. Uh, so it's, we were uh, successful in delineating the high K pathways, and this is called a variance map, which shows the uh, level of uncertainty. This one here shows the corresponding uh, specific storage distribution. So uh, the blue color over here shows the results of low specific storage. 
and uh, a green shows higher values of specific storage. And uh, in a fracture, you, what you typically find is that the hydraulic conductivity is high and the specific storage tends to be very low. So when you look at the diffusivity, which is the K divided by S of S, the diffusivity through the fracture is uh, quite high. And actually, this is what we were able to map uh, which is both the high hydraulic conductivity zone and the low specific storage zones. Uh, and those dashed lines indicate the uh, location of the fractures. Um, we also conducted a TC dissolution experiment where we uh, injected uh, some TCE, a non-aqueous phase liquid, into a a small area over here and, and uh, let water flow through the uh, rock, fractured rock block, the same one that we uh, did the testing for hydraulic tomography. Um, so that's the inverse modeling of the uh, multiple, um, well, the three pumping tests that were conducted in the rock block. And uh, we monitor the, the arrival of the TC. And on the right, what we show is the concentration distribution with time, or the breakthrough curve, uh, and the corresponding flow rate through the, the rock block. And what we did was we constructed two types of models. One is called a discrete fractured network modeling approach. So that is an approach that you um, build in the fractures explicitly into the modeling domain. And so this assumes that we know precisely where the fractures are, their apertures, their connectivity, and so on. And what we did was we used hydrogeosphere to do the modeling and show that the observed response can be quite uh, well simulated. Uh, with the discrete fracture network model. But again, we have to remember that this assumes that we know perfectly where the fractures are. Uh, the other case is a stochastic continuum approach. So this is the case in which we use the map of the uh, map of the hydraulic conductivity field that was obtained from from hydraulic tomography. And so this is the this is the result that we used to simulate the transport of TCE from this location down through the fractured rock. And uh, we find that the match is not as good, but we can still capture the overall breakthrough curve, including the tailing, um, quite well. And uh, this actually on the left is the, the actual sort of the entire experiment. Here is a blow up of the sort of the early time behavior and uh, to the intermediate time. So that we see that the stochastic continuum approach does uh, quite well as well, too. So what we found out was that we, we can delineate uh, the fractures and the hydraulic properties of that, such as the hydraulic conductivity and the specific storage through the inverse code uh, SSLE developed by uh, Professor Jim Ye and his students. Um, it's kind of time consuming and expensive to model TC field dissolution using the discrete fracture approach. And uh, that uh, perhaps maybe the stochastic continuum approach may be, um, may be useful at a given site, especially if there are a large number of Packer tests available, um, such as at the Smithville site. Uh, or if it's not in the source zone, then perhaps uh, pumping tests can be conducted to try to map the fracture zones and use that information for, for the transport modeling. Um, but I think I guess one other thing I wanted to mention was that the statistical properties of uh, these fractures will be very important in determining the transport behavior of uh, the aqueous phase plume uh, from the source area. Um, so I want to finish off by talking uh, about the field site and the, the modeling results. And so this is the plan view of the Smithville site. And this shows the, the, uh, the different wells that are located at the site. The R wells are the recovery wells. And so these are the, the pump and treat wells. This is the source zone over here. And we're going to show you a cross section through the 
uh, site. And so we have uh, a layer cake type of uh, geology consisting of uh, carbonate rocks and shales. They're uh, highly fractured. Uh, and uh, this figure over here shows the distribution of hydraulic conductivity and uh, lithology of the different units. So on top we have the overburden, we have the Aramosa unit, the Bimount, Goat Island, and Gasport. And you can see that the hydraulic conductivity varies uh, quite a bit. Uh, and uh, this um, uh, figure over here shows the different uh, geological units and the geometric mean of each of the, the units. Um, and um, what we see is a, a quite variable, uh, quite a bit of variability in terms of the hydraulic conductivity at the site. Uh, this figure shows the hydraulic head distribution. Uh, there are these uh, bullseyes over here because of the, the fact that there are pumping wells uh, extracting, uh, trying to control actually the migration of the uh, aqueous phase plume down gradient. Um, and this is a, a contraplot that shows the um, what is this, the TC plume with concentration given in terms of micrograms per liter uh, back from 1988. Um, I think this was actually prior to the beginning of the pumping wells uh, and, and the operation of and that. The black dot is a municipal drinking water well. Yeah, so this is a municipal uh, drinking well, which was shut down. One of the key results that we found out was that while this pumping took place over many years, uh, we actually uh, accounted for the extracted mass. And so here we have the mass removed versus the total pumping rate. And what we found out was that despite the fact that a large volume of water has been pumped out for many, many years, uh, the actual mass that has been recovered from these wells has been exceedingly small. Um, I think on the order of 15 kilograms of TCE has been recovered over two decades of pumping. Um, the other finding that we found uh, was obtained from the sites was that uh, Justin Clark, who was a master student who worked for this project, did some sampling at the site. And uh, he's looked at uh, sub, you know, the results of uh, TCE and other chlorinated solvents uh, or the aqueous phase form of that from the different um, wells and found that the, the distribution be, can be quite different from uh, the time of the year, uh, um, whether it's in December, March, June, uh, September, and January. Uh, the, the concentrations can be quite different. And this well over here, 3S8, is a well that is actually close to the source zone. And what we found was that the, the concentration of TCE was uh, quite high and um, perhaps variable throughout the year. But what we didn't see was that uh, the, the degradation products were not very prominent. But when we move away from the source area into R7 and some of the other wells, we start to see the uh, degradation products such as uh, cis-DC, VC, ethene, and ethane. Um, and uh, so Justin also took a large number of uh, samples from um, these wells to try to study the, uh, both the chlorine, and this should be carbon over here, I'm sorry about that, but he did a number of uh, uh, rounds of sampling for uh, the carbon and chlorine isotopes of both TCE and, and DCE and found that um, some of the wells show smaller fractionation while others show a larger levels of fractionation. And that's due to the fact that some of these wells are closer to the source zone while others are much further away. And so perhaps the, the, the biodegradation may be uh, not, you know, um, maybe inhibitory near the source zone where, where the uh, TC concentrations might be uh, very high and so the bacteria may not be very active. However, away from the source area we see um, a higher degree of fractionation, which suggests that 
biodegradation is taking place. Um, we haven't been able to really study the effects of the flow dynamics and the effects of the heterogeneity, but um, this is something, um, this is one reason why we see quite a bit of scatter in the uh, isotope levels, but uh, there's also variable recharge taking place at the site. Uh, it's highly fractured, and so perhaps one can expect some level of variability in the isotope results, but I think that further analysis is perhaps uh, uh, warranted to try to really understand how isotope transport takes place and how it's affected by all of these different factors such as sorption, biodegradation, recharge, volatilization, and so on. So in terms of the key findings, uh, the hydraulic conductivity distribution is very heterogeneous. Um, the pump and treat operation has been going on for many decades, but the removal uh, of the uh, DNAPLE is found to be uh, minimal. And that, um, however, um, the, both the chemical data, which I haven't really alluded to in this talk, uh, but the isotope data suggests that biodegradation is occurring at the site and that the dominant process is most likely reductive dechlorination and that further conversion of DC to more degraded compounds is also supported by chemical and isotopic data. Um, and the last part uh, is the numerical modeling of the uh, lab and field data and so uh, we have built a very large scale model using hydrogeosphere to consider both surface water and groundwater interaction uh, throughout this uh, basin area. This is the Smithville site that uh, is under consideration and this is the grid that shows the, uh, well this is the grid where there, there are these natural boundaries, there's a spring and there's a 12, 20 mile creek over here and uh, the grid is highly refined uh, in this area and you can see the, the layering of the model in this uh, inset figure. Um, we were able to achieve uh, a calibration of the heads, uh, so this shows the, the head distribution and uh, some of the information that was obtained from a previous student that was here. Uh, and also the simulated heads versus observed heads um, matched up quite well. Um, and um, instead of using the multi-phase compositional model for the entire domain, which would be very computationally in intensive, we decided to take a two-step approach by first utilizing comp flow to try to accurately or, or try to better represent the Dean Apple source zone. And so uh, we built uh, a fractured domain and uh, considered the fracture distributions from the investigations that were done at the site from the cores and, and, and so on, the borehole television surveys, and built a, a realizations or, or statistical sort of samples of uh, fractures and then we spilled Dean Apple onto these fractures to try to obtain um, a representative uh, source zone. And once we were able to obtain the sort of the Dean Apple source, we would uh, export this information to hydrogeosphere to this, uh, it's kind of hard to show but to this grid and actually do the uh, transport simulation um, to try to uh, model the uh, transport of the, the plume behavior. Um, and we've done a d different cases uh, by considering um, the fact that the TC doesn't constitute 100% of the aqueous phase, but uh, we've also considered uh, the fact that there could be other components present and uh, we've also considered the fact that, um, that the source area could have a lower hydraulic conductivity uh, to, to sort of model the flow bypassing effects, but in the end we were able to uh, simulate uh, in general the evolution of the mass that has been removed from the site um, over, over the, the several decades. 
And uh, the other sort of important finding that we got from this uh, modeling study was uh, this is a figure that shows the uh, distribution of um, 10 mil micrograms per liter TCE uh, contours. And you can see the difference in the distribution or the contour or the extent of the plume. So here, if we have no decay and uh, if you have the pumping, um, we would see that the plume extending all the way out here. Um, and if we have decay but no pumping, we would have uh, a small, much smaller extent of the 10 microgram per liter contour. And what we see over here is decay with pumping. And so what this suggests is that the pumping itself is not able to actually control the migration of the plume off site and that biodegradation is uh, quite important in controlling the, the migration of the plume um, or, or keeping the plume on site. So in terms of the key findings, we found that ComFlow was able to show that uh, Dean Apple penetrates into the matrix and this can perhaps have uh, significant effects on the distribution of the source zone saturations and obviously that's going to have an impact on how the plume is going to emanate from the source zone. Uh, the modeling results showed that we were able to uh, achieve a pretty good agreement between the, the plumes that are emanating from the source zone and, and the simulated results. Um, and uh, we also found out that the pump and treat operation is perhaps not very effective. Um, I'm, we're not saying that it's not entirely effective, but what's probably more import in, important is the uh, first order biodegradation that is occurring at the site, which was also verified by the chemical and the isotopic study. Uh, which shows that this is what's really important in controlling the plume at the site. And finally, the application of the multi-phase compositional model is not perhaps uh, realistic with current comp computational resources at the full-blown scale, but perhaps ComFlow will be, still be useful to, to simulate the migration of the Dean apples in the source zone area to create different scenarios which can then be extracted and put into other models, preferably hydrogeosphere, but perhaps to other models that, that can simulate the plumes from there. So in terms of conclusions and summary, summary we have developed new modeling approaches. Comflow, which is a numerical model that can simulate multi-phase and multi-component flow and transport, which has been modified to include discrete fractured network capabilities and isotope fractionation. Um, and we show that the numerical simulations show that the, the, the isotope signature can be significantly influenced by multi-phase flow and that there are different processes which may compete which can affect uh, the, the isotope results and so proper accounting for this is probably needed. Uh, in terms of numerical simulations to understand processes, I think they're very important uh, because we're dealing with a very compl complicated set of uh, processes uh, involving gas phase, non-aqueous phase, liquid phase, and so on. And these numerical simulations, um, while some may criticize that it could be too complicated, but actually they, they uh, shed important insight onto the different processes. And so I think it has been a very useful exercise to try to study how mass flux takes place down, downstream and its relationship with source depletion and dissolution. Um, we also showed that the, the matrix permeability and its effects on the, uh, the penetration of gene apples and I think one of the important findings from this study is that the, the capillary saturation effects or the curves can have a significant impact on where gene apple may go and if it goes into the uh, matrix itself then the remediation of that is going to be extremely import, uh, difficult and so that the determination of the capillary pressure saturation curves 
and some of these other parameters, I think, is, is going to be very important in, in doing assessments at other Department of Defense sites. Um, and um, the other sort of uh, results include, you know, I think we all kind of know that the apple source zone architecture is very important. Uh, but the statistics of the fracture network geometry and the hydraulic characteristics of the fracture and matrix also are very important in determining where the Dean apples go. And so perhaps the new methods need to be developed or to try to uh, obtain the statistics of fracture permeability, uh, say like the correlation lens and so on. Um, and we know that mass flux is extremely difficult to be lowered to compliance values, even with small amounts of Dean apples uh, uh, remain in this, uh, the source area. In terms of inverse modeling, Comflow is very comprehensive, but we found out earlier in the project that it may not be practical to do field scale simulations, and especially to, 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 to do it in a Monte Carlo mode. Uh, to try to address uncertainty. And so, therefore, we decided that perhaps inverse modeling with Comflow may not be technically be feasible. So uh, we uh, took another approach to try to uh, use analytical solutions to try to estimate degradation rates and splitting factors. But we also did inverse modeling of pumping tests and so on to try to see whether we can map the fracture zones and found out that hydraulic tomography analysis of these multiple pumping tests shows very promising results of mapping the hydraulic conductivity and specific storage distributions uh, of fractured rock sites. In terms of isotope studies, uh, we have new method for determining hydrogen isotopes, which, has, which, has, uh, which is very promising. Um, the method shows very high accuracy and precision, um, and that batch and column experiments are showing the higher fractionation of chlorine isotopes uh, compared to carbon isotopes and that uh, we're trying to finish off uh, these batch and column uh, studies also with uh, hydrogen, um, and hopefully the PhD students will be finished by this summer. Uh, in terms of the field studies from the Smithville site, uh, so again, Dean Apple penetration from the fracture into the matrix can take place, and I think that the panel needs to consider this fact and uh, perhaps uh, per uh, consider this at other DOD sites too. Uh, because this is going to affect uh, the designs of the uh, remediation techniques that uh, perhaps active flushing of the source zone, say with permanganate and so on, may not work because of the bypassing effect of the, the chemicals uh, because the Dean apples, instead of being in the fractures, will be in the matrix and the fact that it will be in the matrix, uh, diffusion is going to take place uh, very slowly and um, sort of the dissolution from the matrix back into the fracture will take exceedingly long times. And so additional simulations, I think, to try to better understand these processes would be uh, beneficial, I think. And that, uh, uh, we talked about comp flow, um, that uh, we also talked about the pump and treat system, which is not very effective and have also only uh, obtained a small, was able to recover only a small amount of mass. Uh, isotope, isotopes have been very useful in, in uh, determining whether biodegradation has been occurring or not, um, and so, uh, combined with, with uh, uh, chemical data, isotope data has been very useful, but perhaps further analysis with numerical models is needed for the improved interpretation of isotopic data. And so in terms of transition plan, we're planning for further field testing of the developed approaches through the ESTCP program and uh, we'll try to pursue funding from other sources as well. 
But in particular, we're interested in the uh, possibility of further investigating isotope transport at Smithville sites or some other DOD sites. So we have a very good capability of uh, uh, numerical modeling uh, capabilities, which I think uh, could be very beneficial to trying to better forecast uh, transport behavior uh, of uh, aqueous phase plumes and also the non-aqueous phase uh, liquids as well at different sites. So this could be done um, at various DOD sites and it should be pursued. Uh, we can also examine uh, Dean Apple penetration into rock matrix and implications of active remediation and natural attenuation. Uh, because the traditional sort of thinking is uh, um, that some have thought of is that the Dean apple will disappear into the matrix because of uh, diffusion. But in some cases, the Dean apple uh, may penetrate the rock matrix, which could really affect uh, the remediation program, in our opinion, at the University of Waterloo. Um, and also affect the corresponding natural attenuation. So this, this should be looked at, I think, very carefully. And in terms of um, practical approaches that will be useful for industry, of course, the modeling tools, I think education will be needed. Um, and uh, uh, so that uh, there are companies like Aquanti that can do that. But there are also tools developed at the University of Waterloo, like the CMM multi-species reactive transport model, which is very comprehensive tool, but simple to use. Uh, this should be used as a screening tool and tested at various uh, DOD sites. And finally, um, the field scale mapping of fractured rocks. We, ha we have a new tool uh, that, that is based on hydraulic tomography, which we think is very powerful. So uh, going forward, we're going to try to partner with our private industry, such as Hydrogeologic, AMAC, GSI Environmental, and Aquanti that was uh, formed by some professors here at the University of Waterloo. And uh, we would be very happy to work with the Department of Defense, DOE, and EPA, and uh, contribute to education and outreach. And uh, we are closing off this project by um, preparing uh, a number of uh, publications that hopefully will be useful to, um, to you and others. So I think that's it. Ed, do you want to make some closing remarks? No, we're fine. I think we're all good to go. Uh, we've listed here some of the papers that are sort of in progress. Various, some are almost ready to submit. Others need a little bit of uh, editing to tune them, if you will. So I think we're uh, finished the presentation on our end. Great, thank you. Are there any questions? Yeah, this is Marvin Unger. Uh, Ed, great uh, talk, Walter, great talk. Um, I do have a question. I think on the, the, the slide where uh, you're uh, discussing the, the batch studies and the column studies uh, that were done by you, Walter, uh, toward the, the front part of the presentation. Um, I, 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 was, I was questioning that a little. I, I noticed that the, the concentrations of TCE that you were, you were working with, and maybe I missed them, um, maybe I missed the, the, the introduction to, the, to this work, but um, I think the high number that you were dealing with was 100 ppms of TCE, which seems that if you're looking at free phase product, is 100 ppms of TCE really representative of um, the presence of uh, high amounts of, of uh, a free phase uh, DNAPL? That seems a little low to me. Yeah, this was... Uh <laughs> not looking at uh, non-aqueous phase liquids uh, sorbing onto the uh, porous materials. Um, here we were looking at aqueous phase TCE sorption behavior. Um, and so we've, uh, yeah, that was just one example, but I, I'm sure that we have done, you know, 
several levels of uh, concentrations for the batch and column experiments. Because I would think that, you know, if you're having free phase uh, uh, TCE, uh, there's going to be a point in time and a concentration of TCE that maybe you would have both dissolved phase as well as um, free phase, uh, maybe in the same area, you know, uh, and I, I'd be interested to see, do they well, come? I think, I think these experiments were designed specifically to look at aqueous phase uh, processes such as sorption uh, and degradation within the aqueous phase on how they affect these isotope ratios. So mm -hmm. these were only considering the aqueous phase. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I think it generally assumed that uh, there's no degradation, for example, occurring in the non-aqueous phase. Okay. So, so it, it, the experiments were done with a range <coughs> of input aqueous phase, for example, TCE concentrations. Uh, we're just showing one example result. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Are there any other questions? Okay. Um, thank you, Ed and Walter, for your time today. We do appreciate you putting in the time to prepare the presentation and provide it. It is very helpful to the program office, and I appreciate your time. Thank you. Well, we certainly, over the years, appreciated the support of CERTA. Um, and I, I think uh, some of the things we have learned here, certainly going to the field, is maybe not necessarily the end of the story. We'd like to continue pursuing some of this work. There are still some gaps that uh, I think we could close in, particularly when it comes to field aspects. Sounds good. Okay. All right. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you all. Bye. Thank you.